thanks for attending this, this Lean Logistics webinar. My name is Ty Buskard, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's topic is Canadian transportation marketplace trends. Canada has a unique set of challenges and cannot be seen as the 51st state when it comes to transportation and logistics. With harsh weather, mountains, vast prairies, long distances between population centers, retailers placing pressure to deliver less product more often, the realities of managing transportation in Canada requires a different approach. We've brought together a panel of experts in the Canadian marketplace, both from the shipper's perspective as well as from the carrier side. At any time, if you have questions you'd like to ask our panel, you can type those into the GoToWebinar client, and you can also follow the discussion on Twitter under the hashtag Canadian Visibility. <coughs> to start off, I'd like to introduce our panel. Norm Sneed is Vice President of Business Development for Vice and Transportation in Mississauga, Ontario. Throughout his career, which spans over 40 years in trucking, he has been involved in various aspects of the industry, including truckload and household moving. Before joining Bison in 2008, he was president of a truckload carrier in the Toronto area, and prior to that, the chief operating officer of a large household moving group with facilities in eastern Canada. Aside from a variety of roles within the companies he's worked, Norm has sat on a number of industry boards and various committees and panels relating to the trucking industry. In 2013, the Ontario Trucking Association recognized Norm with their Service to Industry Award. Bison is one of Canada's largest transportation companies and has been in business for 44 years. With their head office in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Bison has seven terminals strategically located across Canada. They have eight operating groups comprising of van, refrigerated, long combination vehicles, logistics, internormal, modal, excuse me, warehouse, dedicated fleet, and LTL. They are recognized as the safest fleet in North America and have been one of Canada's 50 best managed companies for 20 consecutive years. Bill Croner, as an account manager for Lean Logistics, oversees the commercial and daily execution activities of Chuck Canada, Hostess Brands, and Dean Foods. Across a team of 19 logistics professionals, including three logistics managers, Bill's res responsibilities include ensuring day-to-day -day excellence and excuse me, execution for his customers, Bill's areas of expertise include continuous improvement, financial reporting, and analytical reporting. Bill Madden is the logistics manager for Lean Logistics CHEP Canada team, overseeing the day-to-day -day execution of CHEP Canada's logistics team. This includes being responsible for a team of three logistics coordinators that manage all CHEP Canada freight, managing strategic projects, and ensuring customer satisfaction through on-time performance. Mike's specialties include lean setup, reporting, and analytics, as well as carrier training. Thank you all. To get us started, we thought we might get, get a bit of a perspective from both the carrier and shipper side of what makes this country unique. Norm, maybe we can get the carrier's perspective first. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Ty. I appreciate being on this panel and on this webinar. <clears throat> uh, we as an industry and a company deal with many different issues in Canada. We're, uh, we're a large country with population pockets separated by great distances. As we know, winter weather can be very se severe, with road closures and frigid temperatures making it very difficult to operate while driving our costs up. You can imagine how difficult it is starting a tractor in 40 below weather. Contrary to this, there can be flooding in western Canada in the spring, causing roads to be closed and traffic rerouted. Service is often impacted during these periods, and I can tell you that it's frustrating on both sides. <clears throat> the largest single issue that we face in our industry is the driver shortage. In short, we simply can't find enough drivers to fill our needs. This is going to get significantly worse as the economy strengthens and manufacturing and the industry goes into high gear. You know, the balance between recruiting and, and driver safety and professionalism is very delicate. You've got to go well beyond a pulse when qualifying a driver. We find that the wrong driver can put you and our customer at considerable risk as a result of accidents, compliance issues, or just overall poor service. At Bison, we'll interview 10 drivers in the hopes of getting one or two that meet our standards. <coughs> The, uh, the driver dynamic is also changing. 
Today's driver comes with far more employment conditions. Their quality of life is important as they don't want to be away from home for long periods of time, and, and, and we get that. In our case, as a long haul carrier, we expect our drivers to be on the road for 22 to 23 days a month. Although it's not at all at the same time, it is a considerable number of days to be away from your family. Many drivers don't want to or can't cross a border. Others want every weekend off and they'll ask for a late start on Mondays. <clears throat> I overheard a driver being interviewed by a recruiting uh, the other day saying, I don't like driving at night. Many don't want to cross mountains and certain cities become very difficult to dis batch drivers to. You can imagine that all of this conflicts with our customers' uh, needs, their pickup and their delivery points, along with schedules that they expect to meet. In some cases, we really feel like we're travel agents. You know, we also continue to work around the various government agencies as they change engine and equipment specifications. And I've got to tell you that in most cases, these are at the expense of miles per gallon. Also, changes in hours of service have had a, 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 different, a definite effect on our productivity, <clears throat> which, which affects uh, capacity eventually. Thanks, Norm. Now, maybe, Bill, you could give us your thoughts on what you're seeing in Canada on the shipper side of the equation. Sure thing, Ty. Thank you. One of the reoccurring themes that seems to affect my team daily is the heavy reliance on uh, having to utilize LTL. Um, and that's primarily due to the sprawling pockets of population across the provinces with some of the great distances that Norm alluded to. Um, you know, utilizing LTL itself isn't unique, uh, but what we do see from a customer service expectation is um, in most of the geographical markets, we continue to see the need for truckload customer service levels, um, but utilizing the LTL shipping um, modes. So what does that mean? Well, traditionally, LTL service is normally only guaranteed to a specific day, um, but we're finding more and more customers requiring these LTL deliveries to, uh, to be guaranteed to a specific window, uh, say from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., We've even experienced certain requests to deliver to uh, within an hour. Um, some of these arrangements are obviously heavily customer specific, um, but you know one approach that we've taken to mitigate the risk in operating in that fashion is to try and negotiate a split day guarantee. So either AM or PM splits the delivery day. Um, that's been successful in some arrangements, but um, <clears throat> not all. So. Excuse me. If that strategy just doesn't work between the AM and PM split, um, we've had to take a hybrid approach in certain aspects, and that includes partnering with a, a strong truckload carrier who can excel at the service level of things but still run profitably in a multi-stop truckload format. Uh, in this approach, we're basically utilizing the advanced route planning function of our TMS and avoiding the traditional cross-stocking exercises so that we can either deliver or pick up direct at the customer. Um, that allows us to give better customer service levels with tighter windows across the larger geographical area, and um, especially useful in, in some of the larger markets such as the greater Toronto area or the GTA um, or the greater Montreal area. Um, it is important though in closing on this, this idea, to keep close tabs on the unique relationship. You've got to make sure that everybody's receiving value from the arrangement. And the carrier remains profitable while executing to your expectations. And make sure that you're, you're more than willing to modify pricing where needed to make sure that all parties are still receiving value. That's great. Th thank you both for that. You know, as, as we sort of move through this, we want to We've spoken a lot about visibility in the market lately, and we sort of wanted to turn our attention to the role that plays in operational excellence in an environment that is so rich in natural challenges. Bill, how do you see visibility enhancing your ability to deliver a better customer experience? Great question. So 
when you take trend analysis and combine it with uh, really the ability to correlate the drivers of your KPIs, it's a huge cat catalyst for continuous improvement. If you have configurable and on-demand access to lane or low-level data, you can choose to put a reporting structure in place that supports uh, managing by exception in critical business areas. You can even tailor that um, and tailor it to have your reporting needs focus on being proactive on other critical areas such as forecasting, um, you know, or going to market strategically with the, with the network RFP. Strategic timing is, is crucial, though, when conducting these RFPs. You really only want to take to, to market the lanes that you know need improvement and make sure the data is driving that decision as well. You don't want to accidentally disrupt any key carrier partners networks trying to uh, force a one-size-fits-all approach with an RFP. Um, at the end of the day, it'll allow you more efficient management, no matter if you're operating within a more traditional static supply chain or, you know, a uh, fast-changing dyna dynamic supply chain. So, Mike, as someone who's directly involved in managing freight every day on the shipper side, how does visibility affect your world as a practitioner? Thanks, Ty. Um, for us, one of the areas where visibility helps the most is understanding where we're underperforming, uh, where it relates to service. Um, you know, it's one thing to know that you are underperforming, uh, but being able to dive down into the data and take a look at the lane or even the load level and pinpoint exactly what's going on is incredibly beneficial. And the reason I say this is because, you know, we found it difficult to make changes at, at, a, at a macro level. Um, so being able to pick out small areas of opportunity and make incremental changes, uh, we've found is often more successful. And I'll give you an example of this. So recently we found that about 90% of our moves from the Woodbridgeville to the Brockville area were appearing to be late. We took a deep dive into the data and, and it showed us that there was actually an issue with the delivery dates that we were entering on our orders rather than an actual carrier performance issue. And this was a huge win for us because when we fully implement the fix for this, we have the potential to boost our on-time delivery by, by about 4%, uh, which is a pretty big win. Another big win for us uh, recently was being able to have visibility to, to our utilization. Uh, we've seen a trend where some of our customers are leaning toward wanting to ship small orders more often, which is what you, what you alluded to earlier. Uh, when we take, took a dive into our data, we found that a handful of our customers in the Toronto area uh, were only filling about 85% of their trailers. And given their volume, um, if we were able to get them to successfully work with us and utilize about 100% of their trailers, we'd be looking at about a $225,000 savings annually. And that's just looking at four customers. So if you can imagine looking across the entire supply chain, there's a lot of very opportunity. So having that deep visibility is, is incredibly helpful. That's pretty significant. So I want to take a break from our presenters um, and turn back to the audience at this point. We're going to put a poll up, and I'd like to ask, what are the visibility challenges our audience sees in the Canadian marketplace? If you go back to your GoToWebinar client, you'll see the slides have changed, and there's a poll on your screen that you can make, make, give us a little bit of feedback on the market trends. We'll come back to our poll a little bit later in the broadcast and see what our audience feels is the most critical issue for Canada. We'll leave this up for a few more seconds, but now let's turn back to our panel. Visibility is clearly driving a new level of customer service and expectation. So Mike, going back to you, how do you use and see technology as a driver in that environment? Sure. So the reporting platform that we have available to us within the TMS, also known as the BI tool, uh, is very powerful. And 
we can really create reports to gain visibility into really any aspect of our transportation, anywhere from spend to performance and anything in between. Uh, the ability for us to schedule these reports, to run at a certain time of day, and email out to the necessary parties is very beneficial. Uh, you know, for me personally, uh, one of the ways I can effectively manage my team is to have visibility to a wide variety of KPIs, as well as being able to keep an eye on certain trigger points that can indicate certain issues such as payment or issues to payment uh, to carriers, missed pickups, and really anything else I can imagine. Um, the nice thing about this is I can schedule these reports so that they're sitting in my email when I walk into the office, which saves me a lot of time from having to run them manually. And, the, you know, on a financial level, um, as an example, on a past account, um, having deep visibility in our transportation network allowed us to identify where short lead time was hurting us financially. We were able to dive down to the lane level and analyze, analyze what it costs us to move freight you know, with less than 24 hours of lead time versus what it would cost us to move it with greater than 24 hours of lead time. And the results were actually pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, we were able to then take this story to the right people, uh, present them the data, and, and it resulted in some pretty significant behavior changes, which also saved about a, saved a fair amount of money. Um, you know, being that this is just one area where money can be lost, there are a lot of other areas that we could look into and find additional opportunities. And one of the best practices that we've seen is being able to provide actual solid data to prove, to prove our ideas or our hunches rather than providing just a concept is always the better route to take. Uh, it sounds like big technology is certainly playing a, a, a deep role on, on the shipper side. So Norm, how is that playing out on the carrier side? Well, technology is very important. Truthfully, we. We, we couldn't run our company today without the significant use of technology. <clears throat> the, the sheer size of our organization, we're a fairly large transportation company, um, along with the demands our customers put on us make technology imperative. You know, for instance, all of our tractors are satellite equipped. This allows us to, to know where instantly the truck is and the load at all times. Uh, we also have immediate uh, contact with the driver, allowing us to make dispatch changes or provide information back to our customers of anything unexpected. It has the ability to advise us of issues en route that may delay a unit. You know, we can advise a customer that a delivery time may not be met and a new appointment is being booked. It's critical from a customer standpoint as they can now make the appropriate uh, arrangements at their end. Let's be honest, no customer likes to hear of an issue en route. However, knowing in advance is very important to them. <laughs> Customers can access our website using their code and track any of their loads in our system. Those that aren't interested in, in using this technology can request load tracing information sent to them. It comes via email and as often or at specific times during the day. The information is real-time and highlights the facts that we have no secrets as it relates to this visibility. <clears throat> you know, it goes without saying that we utilize uh, costing programs, load optimization software, and all of our dispatch and planning functions are computerized. There's, there, there's also a host of support programs that allow us not only to run our business, but to check the efficiency of what we're doing. <clears throat> and that's very important to us. We also meet regularly with many of our customers to review our performance and in some cases their scorecard of us. Many of our customers track certain things that are important to them from a carrier standpoint, put it on a scorecard and we'll meet with them either quarterly or in some cases monthly just to review the, the stats. 
We also provide uh, many customers with monthly uh, summary reports and in, in a format that they require. Everybody seems to have a different requirement and we're able to adapt to that. Okay, thanks guys. A lot of great discussion. Um, so let's jump back to our poll for a second. Our audience has responded with their thoughts for the need to visibility and let's have a look at what they were. Well, no surprise here, capacity across all modes. It really seems that as we come into a capacity crunch, the, the, that relationship with the carriers becomes becoming more and more important, making sure we can find capacity. Hopefully in some of our future webinars, we'll be able to drill further down into what that means and how we help create that, that environment. So with that, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's want to thank everyone who responded and turn back to our panel. So what are some of the trends in Canada? So as we start to think about the direction things that are, are taking in Canada, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? Norm, from, from the carrier perspective, where do you see things going? Well, you, you saw it in that, that, that survey. Uh, it's becoming more difficult to find capacity, and I'm going to tell you this is only going to get worse. <coughs> the last four years or so, I've seen a lot of capacity leave the industry. Fleets shrunk due to volume issues. And it, when you look at, at the lack of uh, the reduction in capacity, it's directly related in our business, it's directly related to, to the driver issues. Uh, drivers, and in particular owner-operators, have left the industry. You know, I don't know another industry where people come to work and are required to have a hundred to $140,000 asset as owner-operators do. You know, they're being drawn to, to other better paying industries. For example, uh, the oil patch in northern Alberta has made the driver pool much smaller uh, as, a, as incomes double with less stress. And, you know, we have an operation in, in uh, Calgary and Edmonton, uh, but, but the oil patch is drawing from all markets. People from down east are, are taking jobs in the oil patch. Uh, so we, we compete with more and more industries for the labor pool that are far more glamorous and attractive than driving. <clears throat> there are far too many leaving this profession and not enough young people entering it. As the economy strengthens, fleets, fleets aren't growing because drivers weren't available. Nobody's going to uh, start acquiring more tractors and have them parked against the fence because they can't find a driver to, to put behind the wheel. This continues today and, and capacity is not improving, it's going the other way. We're also seeing that customers are becoming more tolerant with respect to transit times and they're looking at other options. However, when you consider the rail, <coughs> excuse me, they're busy and they're experiencing significant capacity issues as well during, during uh, certain peak periods where shippers require service. And, you know, as anyone would expect under these conditions, rates are going up. Carriers are looking at the best options for their capacity. And let's be clear, best option isn't limited to price, but also ease of transport, customer flexibility, and all the terms and conditions of carriage. It is widely known, he who has the drivers wins. We have to hire and retain the best quality driver possible just to ensure that we can perform to our customers' expectations. In order to do this, we have to pay and provide the best environment we can for our fleet. This is our ongoing uh, goal, and it's, it's something that we battle every single day. Thanks, thanks Norm. So, Bill, as, as someone uh, who runs a, a bunch of shipper organizations, how are you seeing this shape up on your side? Well, interestingly enough, so some of the, um, the trends we're seeing here actually are working to um, fight those capacity issues that Norm just touched on, right, in, in a way to, um, through collaboration, get around some of the constraints. So on a shipper side, what we, what we are seeing nowadays is more and more collaboration across shippers. The, uh, the areas of the partnership that are relationship critical to bring value, um, what we've seen most of really has just been around consolidating purchasing power, uh, mainly through intermodal, but there are some uh, truckload elements to this as well. 
um, just through the uh, partnership arrangement, maybe utilizing the larger partner's buying power or capacity, um, purchasing power, um, and basically looking to drive economies of scale by sharing the container or trailers uh, between the shippers. Um, so really um, one of the key critical areas to make these relationships work is that both parties have some sort of advanced TMS system so that um, they have EDI capability amongst each other. Um, you really, it's imperative to have real-time shipping information and payment data. Uh, many times only one party, the larger party, right, is responsible for payment to the carrier, um, but you certainly need um, on-demand access to this data to uh, analyze the relationship and, and the value that it is bringing to both parties. An interesting sidebar to that is that because of these partnerships, we've actually seen other um, areas of partnership with, within the same shipper collaboration group come to light that really have things, they're, they're specific to supply chain things, but they're outside the realm of uh, traditional transportation arrangements. And they never would have came to light, period, had we never got into the original consolidation of uh, the transportation on that partnership. So uh, it's good stuff there. So with that, all that in mind, what do you think the shippers need to be doing next? Well, try and summarize this efficiently. It really brings back a lot of the, uh, the points that have been made um, in today's webinar uh, by both Mike, Norm, and myself. Um, in general, shippers need to make sure that they have enterprise visibility. Uh, really, you need, to, you need to be able to see and have on-demand access to the metrics that are driving your business. Um, you know, you, you really um, should have a proven TMS platform so that you can look at your, your drivers um, from a KPI standpoint accurately and efficiently. Um, as Mike alluded to, you want to make calculated and timely decisions that are data driven. That's ultimately just going to help you adapt to changing market conditions. Um, and uh, with good practice, you can change your focus on being um, proactive rather than reactive. Another area that continues to show significant return on investment um, is really the employing of driver-friendly processes at the dock and facility level. Norm has alluded to um, the capacity concerns out there in Canada, ultimately related back to the driver shortage. And um, that was simply shown in the results of the poll that we all saw. So um, becoming viewed as a shipper of choice by your carrier base is really going to drive your, your tender acceptance on your routing guides and, and set you up in a good way that uh, you should see you know, positive impact to your bottom line by controlling your costs um, and getting yourself in a better position when negotiating, negotiating time comes to have a stronger position and influ influence with your carrier partners um, on future rate discussions. I think if you take those two and you focus on um, those two key areas, I think you're going to be well positioned to um, build the strategic relationships you need um, to get you through this capacity crunch. And as Norm has alluded to, it's, it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. So um, it's better to get in front of it now uh, while you can. So Norm, with that in mind, what do you think shippers should be doing to make themselves more attractive to you as a carrier and, and the, the other industry players? Well, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I really like seeing that build strategic relationships with your carrier partners, <clears throat> excuse me, I think shippers have to start realizing that the driver issue is their problem as well. You know, let's be clear here, if we can't find the driver, shippers won't receive the service. This is a problem that has to be solved by both sides. You know, shippers and receivers must be more accepting of drivers and respect them for what they do and the difficult job they perform. I recently met with one of our drivers who was complaining about a customer. He told me that the facility had a sign on the door prohibiting drivers from using the washroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yet the driver had to wait 
on site until the receiver would start unloading them. He then asked if he could use a photocopier to copy a bill of lading and was refused. Customers and shippers have to realize that the, realize the driver's role is the most critical component in moving their freight. You know, there are other sides to this. You know, we've got a customer down in the U.S. during Driver Appreciation Week that hosts a barbecue for all drivers on site that week, not just ours, all of them. You know, we, we sent a letter uh, to the company acknowledging what they had done and how much we, Bison, appreciated them for doing this uh, for our drivers. So uh, there are both sides. <clears throat> Customers also have to start uh, to, to lock in capacity for longer terms and, and develop true partnerships with carriers. Customers can't continue to expect carriers to, to provide their best pricing based on the carrier being efficient and productive, then when the carrier achieves, achieves some efficiencies, the business is put to bid and the carrier's network changes. Then we're starting from ground zero again. Shippers and carriers have to work together, ensure, ensuring that the relationship benefits both parties. Carrier, I believe carrier agreements should go beyond a year. If the carrier is performing to your satisfaction, and sit down with them and, and negotiate the terms for the next year. Allow us to continue building efficiency within our own operation. <clears throat> the other thing is, you know, we make money when we're moving, not when we're delayed at a customer's dock. Anything shippers and receivers can do to eliminate delays at either end, allowing the driver to get back on the road and move, will definitely benefit uh, both parties. This, this is critical to improving capacity and efficiency. <clears throat> also, let's be fair with the terms and conditions of carriage. You know, we pay our drivers weekly, and most uh, trucking companies pay fuel companies, the, the, the fuel suppliers, every one to two weeks, depending on the carrier. These are the two largest expenses we have. We, we want to get paid within 30 days, so at least we can pay pay our drivers promptly and, and satisfy the fuel companies. We shouldn't have to finance our customers. Also, let's, let's be fair with accessorials, allowing us reasonable compensation, which when issues you know, uh, occur beyond our control, sometimes it's beyond your control as well. But uh, you know, for, all, for all parties to be successful, we have to work closely together and tackle some of these issues. Thanks, Norm, and I want to thank the rest of the panel. We're almost done our webinar for today, but before we go, we'd like to take a couple of, of questions uh, from the audience. We will also respond back to any questions we don't have time to get to this morning uh, so, or this afternoon. We'll get those out to you as quickly as possible. So Norm mentioned harsher weather conditions. What are some of the precautions or expectations that, that you should have when, when there's harsher weather conditions hit? Well, you know, from our standpoint, uh, we, we pay close attention to the weather. We've got people monitoring it uh, daily, you know, hourly in some cases. When we know that bad weather's coming in, we, you know, we, we dispatch our drivers earlier uh, to avoid a delay. We're, we're pre-starting trucks to make sure that uh, we don't have an issue. Um, and, and we're contacting customers, letting them know that if, if unexpected weather hits, there's going to be an issue. But from a customer standpoint, work with us. If, if we get there an hour late because, because we're delayed, then try and fit us in rather than sitting us to the, uh, for uh, you know, an indefinite time until, and, until you can squeeze us in. We're, we're just trying to do everything we can to get the freight there on time and meet your expectations. So if customers can show flexibility and work with us, that's important to us. Uh, we're going to let you know um, wh when we're delayed. We're going to try and be as accurate as possible telling you when that load's going to get there. But as you know, weather, weather is unpredictable and, and traffic conditions can, can cause a lot of problems. The other thing is, in, in some cases, it can be a beautiful sunny day where you are, yet the issue is 600 miles away. So we just ask that our customers work with us and, and be flexible. So, Bill, maybe uh, maybe from the shipper's point of view, what are some of the things that uh, that, that you you do during, in harsher weather? Sure thing. Um, you know, 
complex question, comp complex issue, but um, from a shipper's point of view, would normally like to tackle that with a uh, standard best practice. And <coughs> excuse me, anything uh, generally over 400 kilometers, we're going to add an extra day of transit to. Um, in addition, <coughs> any additional um, um, lead time that we can give to our carriers, we know is going to pay off for our own supply chain in the end. So. Um, as these storms come and go, um, we try and look, to look ahead, predict ahead, and any additional lead time from giving the tender to the carrier from the, uh, from the tender time to the pickup date, we know we're ultimately just going to uh, benefit from in the end. So um, those are typically two of the, uh, the most applied solutions to the issue that we, we, we get out there. Okay. Yeah, and I think we have another time for another question here. Uh, let's see here. What are some of the constraints or trends with cross-border or port issues? Mike, maybe you can give us some of your thoughts on that. Sure, Ty. Um, you know, I think when it comes to cross-border issues, I think probably the, the obvious biggest constraint is the amount of time it takes to cross the border. Um, you know, shippers who are, are moving freight from the, across the U.S. Canadian border should typically factor in additional time into their transit, and especially with you know the way things are going with heightened security at the border. Um, typically, my team will try to factor in an, an additional day or day of transit uh, for anything over, say, 300 kilometers, and, and that really just helps us take that into account. Um, and then there are some of the lesser known concerns um, or things that should be considered, right? So uh, just as an example, um, a few weeks ago, we had a driver picking up a load in Texas, and he was headed up to Ontario. Um, about 600 kilometers into his trip, we realized he had the wrong product on his truck. So this is obviously a problem. Um, typically, you know, a shipper might find a nearby facility, have them deliver that product there, get the right stuff, and then head back on up um, to its final destination. But unfortunately, being that this is a, you know, a Canadian-based driver, we only had two options, both of which were pricey. Uh, the first option was we could turn them around, send them back that 600 kilometers to get the right thing, and then head back north was going to be a couple thousand dollar loss. Or the other option, which is actually what we ended up going with, was to continue him on um, to Canada. And then we dealt with, you know, getting product picked up from Canada and delivered to a closer border state. Um, and that, that, that seemed to be the best option. You know, it's, it's an unfortunate scenario. Um, but in those cases, it's a reality and your options are limited, so. So, Norm, maybe from the carrier side, what do you see with some of the uh, some of the border issues? Well, we, we, we get hung up every now and then at the border as well. I mean, we've got all the border crossing clearances and, and whatnot, but at the end of the day, um, if, if, if there's a delay at the border, then we're in that lineup. We ask our customers to make sure that the documentation is, is in order, we have it properly describes uh, the product. Uh, our, our concern is that all of a sudden something doesn't match and they pull you over and they inspect the load and, and you could be there for five or six hours and every time the driver's there he's on duty he's, he, he's, running, he's running out of hours so uh, j just be diligent in, in ensuring the paperwork is accurate and, and uh, correctly reflects what's, you know, what's in the trailer so that our drivers can cross as quickly as, as possible without any issues. Super. I want to thank all of, our, all of our attendees today for the questions they've posted. We are, we're unable to get to all of them this afternoon, so we will get those, the answers back out to you. So I want to say thanks again to our panelists for their insights and expertise, and I'd also like to thank everyone who attended the webinar. Uh, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after this broadcast. As mentioned before, this is a webinar series, and other thought leadership webinars are available on demand at leanlogistics.com in the resources section. 
You can look for our next webinar coming up on December 18th where we'll be t talking again how Lean Logistics is building better supply chains together. Again, thank you for your time, and we hope to see you on future webinars.